up on 20 on ID. A Soviet immigrant pursuing the American dream, clearing his land to build a home. And the neighbor, he says, standing in his way. Ah, stop cutting trees. Then... What's going on there? Well, the neighbor assaulted me and I shot him. Was he acting in self-defense? He acted like a gangster, like a tough guy, like a mafioso. Or was he just out for revenge? Bilkin saw himself as this sort of modern-day Dirty Harry. Go ahead. Make my day. Who is this guy? This man who murdered my father. Plus, the prominent surgeon who was a hero. We'll care for you just as I care for my own family. Everywhere but home. You're out of your mother mind. He slapped me. He pushed me. He grabbed my hair. Behind closed doors, turning from brutal to bizarre. I think we put a gun to our head to get attention. Look at my face. You see a man driven to insanity. What lies beneath? Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. It can happen in an instant. Someone snaps with tragic, even deadly consequences. And in the aftermath comes the realization that a hidden rage was simmering just beneath the surface. You're about to see two stories of people whose outward appearance masked a dark and dangerous side. First, neighbors embroiled in a property dispute. But as Matt Gutman first reported in 2014, the boundaries in this explosive story were about far more than just land. In the lush green hills of Gentile, Encinitas, California, a toxic tale of shrubbery the invasive Brazilian pepper tree, and two men losing it in a dispute over clearing poisonous bushes from a driveway. 911 emergency. My partner just got shot. Please come to blow that road. Please hurry, hurry. He's bleeding, got shot in the head. For Evelyn Zeller, March 28, 2013, began as a beautiful day. Hey, they're all beautiful days here in the San Diego suburbs. That morning, she awoke in the master bedroom of this rented Spanish contemporary and shared a tender moment with her boyfriend, John Upton. It was my birthday. John woke me up to wish me a happy birthday. She says Upton, still in his pajamas, headed outside to make room for two day laborers clearing brush on the driveway of their neighbor, Michael Vilkin. John went out to offer to yes. move the car. Yes. To understand what happened next, you need to understand the lay of the land. Upton lived here. Bilkin owned the adjacent, undeveloped 2.6 acre lot, including this narrow strip, his future driveway. The problem was these Brazilian pepper trees along that strip had become a creeping menace. Choking off access, and Bilkin needed them gone. On this morning, Upton's Mercedes SUV is parked beside the trees on Vilkin's land. He wanted to move the car to give them more space to trim the trees. Just a couple of minutes later, Evelyn gets up to follow him outside. I had set foot on the first step right there as I heard the shots. Using this massive 44 Magnum revolver, Vilkin shoots 56-year-old John Upton once in the midsection followed several seconds later by a second shot to the head, execution style. So I look up the path and I see John lying on the path. And you instantly knew that he was dead? I felt he was dead. And suddenly I hear Vilkin go, don't get any closer. And he has the gun pointed at my chest. He had a crazy, crazy dude. He's got a gun. Oh my God. What a nuts. The Russian guy, he's still got a gun. You gotta be careful. None of it makes sense. Cold-blooded murders just don't happen around here in sunny Encinitas. And neither of these men were magnets for trouble. Certainly not the diminutive, cerebral, and hard-working Michael Vilkin. It was just a shock to imagine that Michael was the one to do that. The neighbors were aghast. Yeah, I talked to him all the time. He was friendly to us. He let us park on his lot. Tomorrow, Vilkin, Michael Vilkin's wife and companion for the past 30 years, stands by her man. Michael has beautiful heart, and other people saying that to me. It's not me saying that. They were God-fearing immigrants who fled the former communist Soviet Georgia and chased their American dream. 
They bought this vacant land on Lone Jack Road after years of scrimping and saving from his past fledgling career as an economist and hers as a piano teacher. So why did you and Michael decide to buy that piece of land? Well, it, w it was a beautiful piece of land with a great view. It's a great neighborhood. And Michael wanted his whole life to give me a present. And that was his present to me. Did he have any, any hopes or dreams for that land? Yes, we wanted to build the house over there and probably retire. Vilkin spent every minute he could spare working the land the old-fashioned way with shovel, wheelbarrow, axe, and saw, lovingly nursing it to health, all for the day they could build their dream home. He was here every day for eight to ten hours a day, tending to his empty lot, cutting things down, moving dirt around. As for Vilkin's neighbor, John Upton, a six foot two, 235 pound teddy bear of a man, wasn't a hero only to his children, John and Elizabeth. So many fond memories. So many memories. And you look at, like, in a span of 56 years of how many things he accomplished and how he's impacted the world. Hello! Hello, Alexandra! To many, he was practically a saint. This is 2020. From ABC News. As reported here on 2020 and 1993, John Upton was a documentary filmmaker who made it his personal mission to rescue Romanian orphans. The Romanian government has put these kids on the back burner. However they want me to do it, I'll do it. But for God's sake, let me, let me help these kids. I really knew from a very, very young age that you really can make a difference because I saw my dad do it. Since then, he'd settled down here with his girlfriend, Evelyn, a new ager enthralled with Upton's Zen. What was it like living with him? <sighs> it was wonderful. He was a man who was always in a good mood. He woke up and he was just happy and content and, and he was so patient with me. And his love was just beautiful. We love Buddhas, we love serenity and peacefulness and inspiration. So where did it all go wrong? The answer is in the poisonous trees on that narrow strip of Vilkin's land. Upton liked them, but remember, Vilkin wanted them gone and his interest in landscaping bordered on obsession. I questioned why he was spending so much time on the walk. He just seemed eccentric. Just seemed a little mm -hmm. eccentric, yeah. Others chose a different word. I think his behavior was absolutely bizarre. I mean, who buys a site and then hangs out on it and works on it 10, 12 hours a day when the same amount of work can be done in a day with a bulldozer? That doesn't make any sense to me. None of what he did was permitted. This was a landslide property. It wasn't safe for the neighbors. Despite those concerns, Evelyn says Upton never complained about his neighbor. He used to say many times, wow, I admire his work ethic. I've talked to my dad for I've talked for, to him every day. Ever. Did he I've, ever mention Vilkin? No, no not. Never even I've mentioned. never heard that name in my entire life. And yet, surely something happened to provoke that brutal homicide on the morning of March 28th. Something that would make the egghead immigrant lose it. Hurry up, hurry up. Hurry up, he's dead. I think he's dead. Hurry up, please. We're before she called 911, before she even approached the crime scene, Evelyn Zeller noticed something odd about the shooter. When you came out, he first saw you. What did he do? He was, uh, he seemed to be on the phone. It's not often that the killer calls in the homicide he's just committed, but that's exactly what happened here. An emergency? I need a uh, detective here. What's going on there? Well, the neighbor saw him and I shot him. In theory, Vilkin did the right thing. He shoots someone, he calls 911. And yet there was something sort of cold and callous about the call. You shot him? Yes. Like with a gun? Yes. Where is the gun right now? I have my gun and don't worry about it. When sheriff comes, it will be in the gun case. I'm a responsible person, don't worry about it. Within minutes, sheriff's deputies arrive to find Vilkin still on the phone with the 911 operator. Hello. Put the phone down, put the phone down. 
He's arrested, but remains cool and so confident that the next day he agrees to talk with our San Diego affiliate, KGTV, expressing no remorse, Hello. but shockingly, Hello, he does Michael. express disappointment. The performance of the massive handgun he used to kill John Upton. This 44 Magnum, because he says it failed to drop him with one shot. <laughs> Michael Vilgen's mission to rid his driveway of Brazilian pepper trees had somehow opened the door to a dark place in his mind where he could justify taking a man's life. Who is this guy? See, this man who murdered my father in cold blood. For what? For good reason, says Vilgen. Because, as he's about to tell us, John Upton was no saint, but a menace who terrorized him like this. Uh, stop cutting trees. Uh. What you're saying is that John Upton deserved to die. Stay with us. One year after blowing away his neighbor with a cannon of a handgun, Michael Vilkin is on trial. The stakes are high. A total of 50 years to life if convicted of first-degree murder. But Vilkin is unfazed. He's confident that this was no murder, but an act of self-defense. This case was justified. Self-defense. Mr. Vilkin protected his life and shot John Hunt. You have to wonder whether Vilkin saw himself as this sort of modern-day Dirty Harry out there to protect himself against the bad guy in defense of a principle. Go ahead, make my day. He told me, you are a fanatic. The way he looked at me would fry a hamburger. Mr. Bilkin loved owning that piece of land. The defense strategy was to put the victim on trial. According to Vilkin, his neighbor, John Upton, seen as a saint for his selfless work rescuing abused orphans in Romania, had a volcanic temper which had been erupting on Vilkin with increasing ferocity as Vilkin pursued his assault on those trees. The heart of the defense here was that Upton was a threat to Vilkin, that he wasn't just this lovable, friendly guy, but he was an angry, aggressive guy who came after Vilkin. The body language was, don't cut the trees here. When he was talking to me angrily, it was like, ah. But what could have transformed Upton from a global do-gooder to the ogre next door? Remember, he didn't even own his home. He was just renting there. The trees were on Vilkin's property, and he had every right to cut them down. As he's standing on this man's own land. The issue is that for Upton, these Brazilian pepper trees weren't just pretty. They provided him and his girlfriend, Evelyn Zeller, with precious privacy. Well, he took privacy away. And it's just like, wow, do you really need to cut these trees down too? I mean, you'll see how it looks. Rising in the witness stand, Vilkin demonstrates how Upton would get in his face. Ah, stop cutting trees. Ah. Only and Vilkin had a powerful witness to attest to this ugly aspect of John Upton's character. I would say John Upton was a, a bully, a dominant, controlling kind of guy who liked to get in people's business. Did he get in your business? Yes, he did. Dwayne Byram is the ex-husband of Upton's girlfriend, Evelyn Seller. When I was dropping off my kids, he'd get in my face. Get back to your car, back to the driveway. You have no right to come to my house. Byram says the verbal abuse was withering and unprovoked. He said, you're a f oh, you're a f get the f off my property. I believe John Upton had a dark side. And so when you hear Michael Vicklin talking about being physically intimidated frequently by John Upton, you're saying that's within the realm of reason. Yes, absolutely. A sheriff's deputy testified that exactly one week before the homicide, Vilkin called for help because Upton's vehicle was parked on Vilkin's driveway where he wanted to work. Mr. Upton got pretty angry 
and um, began pointing at Mr. Uh, Vilkin and said, uh, don't come any closer to me, something similar to that. In fact, Vilkin made several calls to the Sheriff's Department for help in dealing with John Upton, but profanity is not against the law, and Upton made no specific threats, so there was nothing the authorities could do. He did not threaten to break my neck. He did not threaten to break my legs, but I'm afraid of him. Afraid, but not deterred. Filkin stood his ground, continuing to cut away at those trees while also purchasing that fateful 44 Magnum and warning the Uptons to steer clear. I nailed a sign. The sign said no parking on the 30 feet road. But was Vilkin secretly plotting something sinister? Two day laborers whose faces we're not permitted to photograph testify that on the morning Vilkin went ballistic, they saw him carrying this gun case when he instructed them to remove the Brazilian pepper trees on the driveway where Upton's car was parked. He told you to, if someone came out, don't worry about getting involved, he would take care of it, correct? Yes. Yes, that's right. He was told basically, don't get involved in anything. Mr. Vilkin indicated that if somebody comes out, he had a gun for them. Vilkin then retreats a little way up the driveway to a partially obscure vantage point along the fence. Now, someone might suggest that you were lying in wait. If I wanted to wait for him, I would not cut bushes. I would grow the bushes and with a rifle, I would wait in the bushes. And sure enough, Within minutes, Upton emerges from his home. And he told you he was going to move his car, correct? I see it. Yes, that's right. I was just afraid to go to work there. Okay, afraid of? Oh, John Upton. I was just very concerned that he might do something, something very dangerous. I took the gun out of the gun case and stuck it in the waste bin. Why did you do that? I was getting ready for eventual confrontation. The prosecution had already put on a parade of witnesses to show premeditation. Sheriff's deputies turned Vilkin's claim of self-defense against him, saying he contacted them five times with questions about his right to carry a gun and stand his ground on his land. He was asking um, when it was legally justified to carry a firearm on his property and when he was justified in using it. Ironically, no witness may have been more damaging to the defense than Vilkin himself. Detached, showing zero empathy for his victim, he coolly recounts the morning of March 28th. John Upton came out of his house and bullied him for the last time. When he was about 10 feet away, I saw a pistol in his right hand. It was like one second, and I pulled out my revolver and shot him. But in fact, there was no pistol in Upton's hand, just a Blackberry. As a practical matter, in a case where you're claiming self-defense, with these facts, Vilkin almost had to testify, and yet he was a pretty terrible witness. He calls the police. Vilkin's attorney, Richard Burkhan, argues it was self-defense. Remember, Vilkin did not run. He stayed and called 911 himself. He could have planned this in such a way that he could have been on a plane to, to Russia uh, before anybody showed up. But he stood there and he stuck around because he believes and he knows he did what he had to do. As the trial winds down, tomorrow Vilkin's faith in her husband and God remain unshakable. And I think everything is in God's hands, you know, right now, whatever he decides. She waits for justice in the sweltering heat of this lonely parking lot outside the jail. And he stood there before the angel. And so as she reads said, the Bible, we visit with a man who thought he could skip that part about thou shalt not kill. Mr. Vilkin, hello. Hello. Are you hopeful? I'm always hopeful. But would the jury see a man just trying to stand his ground or a stone-cold killer 
Has the jury reached verdicts? Yes, we have, Your Honor. Stay with us. John Upton is dead. It has been 18 months since his family tearfully buried him. Michael Bilkin is alive, but the jury is about to make the fateful decision about the rest of his life. This isn't bang, bang. He is taking his time. In his closing arguments, the prosecutor opens up on Bilkin, blasting holes in his story, saying his claim of self-defense is indefensible. That gun was overkill. Prosecutors clearly believe this wasn't a fight that culminated in someone getting shot. They believe this was an execution. Portraying not a frightened, diminutive immigrant, but quite possibly the first person in this jurisdiction to commit murder over landscaping. The neighbor assaulted me and I shot him. You shot him? Yes. Calm, collected, trying to assure the 911 operator that he is a responsible person. The defense scrambling. It sounds so stupid. We're talking about trimming trees. It's on this man's land. Defense attorney Richard Burkhan tries to assert that the Georgian Emma Gray was simply engaged in that most American of activities, protecting his homestead. Draw upon your common sense. You've got a much larger person and a much smaller person that's going, don't work here anymore. And that's what Mr. Bilkin was enduring, threatening behavior. But it was his unsympathetic demeanor on the witness stand, often nonchalant, sometimes even laughing, that had more of an impact on jury foreman Brooke Haley. The fact that he was his own character witness and he didn't acquit himself well. I uh, am ashamed to uh, use this figure of speech, but he shot himself in the foot on the stand. Yeah. Finally, in June 2014, the verdict. We, the jury in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Michael Vilkin, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. First degree murder. Those words cruelly ricocheting in Tamara Vilkin's head. When you were sitting there in court, and you heard murder in the first degree. What went through your mind? I didn't believe it. I did not believe it. I still don't believe it. I'm going to appeal as much as, as far as I can go. It doesn't matter whatever it takes. I am going to fight. We meet outside the courthouse and jail complex. Inside, just a few yards down these grim, color-coded halls, behind that thick glass, we meet inmate Vilkin. Hello, Mr. Vilkin, how are you? Still emitting a glow of self-righteousness. What did you think that they were going to give you? What was the verdict that you expected? The worst case, that's what. Vilkin says when he bought that land, he felt like a citizen farmer, nurturing it until he was ready to build. Why was it so important to you? What were your dreams for that land? I wanted to uh, clear the land from the wood and uh, to build the house there. Those fuzzy dreams, he says, were soon uprooted by his fear. Or was it enmity for that bear of a neighbor, John Upton? Did he ever raise a hand at you? No, he did not. But I was afraid of him, really afraid, because he was roaring at me, he was yelling at me. On the stand, and in person, you don't seem like someone who is afraid. Understand? Well, you didn't show any emotion. You never showed that you seemed afraid. I'm not a Hollywood actor. But in Vilkin's mind, he embellished the neighbor feud into a Hollywood mobster movie, starring John Upton as the villain. He acted like a gangster, like a tough guy, like a mafioso. What you're saying is that John Upton deserved to die? No. I'm saying that I saw a mafioso and I was afraid of him. Mr. Vilkin, it sounds, no offense, but it sounds like you're detached from reality. This was a fight over shrubbery. This had nothing to do with mafia. No, he encroached on the road. So you expected to shoot him? I expected to act in self-defense. Regrets? Not even a few. If you spit in my face, I will not just turn around and and leave. You don't turn the other cheek? No. No. And Upton was, figuratively speaking, was spitting in my face 
clear. But pro beneath all that bravado, and it's clear Filkin knows he shattered the person he loves most. Do you feel badly for your wife? For tomorrow? Yes. Yes, of course. Because you know that this has destroyed her. She loves you more than anything in the world. I know. When you think of your dream plot of land, what do you think of it now? I wish we never bought it. Why do you wish you never bought it? Because it brought nothing but pain to us. Vilkin, his beard whiter now after 18 months in jail, tells me he'll appeal, saying his lawyer was incompetent. And he's got a handwritten note that he wants us to read, listing his complaints. Defense counsel did not explain to the jury the effect of provocation. I was sitting there like a hostage while my defense counsel was blowing hot air. But as we wrap the interview, this convicted killer, who at times smiled like a kindly uncle, patiently answering all of my questions without a hint of anger or remorse, leaves me with one final chilling thought. Are you hopeful? I'm always hopeful. Unless I see a pistol in your hand. Then you shoot me. Then I will shoot you in one second. Our time is over. Vilkin turns and walks to the guard station, cheerfully nodding to his jailers. Outside, his victim's daughter still struggling to come to terms with her loss. I can't believe that it really happened. I wake up and I feel like, okay, when is this movie going to end? And all for what? For nothing. That's the worst part. Two years after the murder of John Upton, the vacant lot at 2902 Lone Jack Road sits abandoned. And though the owner and his neighbor are long gone, those Brazilian pepper trees will soon grow back. Their strangling vines and poisonous fruit, a testament to the toxic obsession that pushed one man over the edge. John Upton's father and children later filed wrongful death civil lawsuits against Michael Vilkin. Vilkin has denied the allegations. Up next, a famous surgeon basking in the public eye. The Brown Hand Center will care for you just as I care for my own family. But when the spotlight is off... I think we put a gun to our head to get attention. He's gone nuts. We're probably going to have to restrain him further. Stay with us. He was a famous doctor, respected for his skills, and known for his family-friendly image. But as Elizabeth Vargas first reported in 2013, Dr. Michael Brown would become known for something else, something far more disturbing. Losing it at 30,000 feet isn't pretty. Like these twin sisters settling a family dispute in the aisles of coach class. I knew it just or these dudes duking it out in the not-so-friendly skies. But when Houstonians heard the news that a local doctor had allegedly used his surgically trained hands to choke a flight attendant, you might have to excuse them if they thought, oh no, not again. You see, this isn't just any doctor. His name is Michael Brown. Guys, no pictures. It's ridiculous. And in recent years, he's had more appointments in courtrooms than operating rooms. I personally believe that he never sees himself as anything but a victim, and that he feels anyone that disagrees with him must be punished. And I think he's a very angry man. At one time, Michael Brown was one of America's leading hand surgeons, an innovator in a treatment for carpal tunnel syndrome with a taste for finer things. For the doctor, that meant a life of Texas excess and exes. He'd already been through two wives by the time he met 20-year-old Darlena in 1993. What was it about him that did captivate you? He was very sweet, just very attentive. Um, to me. Treated me like a princess in the beginning. Did he buy you gifts? Yeah, he absolutely um, spoiled me in the beginning. After two weeks, they were living together, married just about a year later, though it almost didn't happen except for Darlena's mother stepping in. 
when they decided to get married, and it was my fault. She uh, decided on, on the wedding day, no, I don't get married. And I thought it was a jitters. To the outside world, Brown looked like a big-hearted healer. His TV commercials brought patients from around the nation to his Houston offices. He had fame. He had fortune. I personally trained the doctors in the Brown procedure. And the Brown Hand Center will care for you just as I care for my own family. Daddy's baby girl. But Darlene says she soon found out how Brown treated his actual family. He used to be very, very sweet, very attentive to my needs, very, I mean, just abnormally sweet to me at all times. And then we get married and things change. It was on the honeymoon that you saw the first example of Mike and his temper? We fought the entire time. We went to um, Maui, which is supposed to be, be, and it is gorgeous. However, we fought every single day. Back home, Darlena says her husband's volcanic temper often erupted when she would go out clubbing with her girlfriends, suspecting she was cheating, especially when he drank. Add to that volatile mix the doctor's beloved gun collection. Darlena was frightened, and after an early separation, she says things only got worse. What happened when you moved back in? That's when the abuse started. He slapped me, he pushed me, he grabbed my hair, hit my head up against the wall. Yeah. Why did you stay in that house? He mentally brainwashed me. If I, if I told him that I was going to leave, he threatened me. He would talk down to her. She was good. She never did anything right. She couldn't cook. I've been over there when he's, why would you fix this? This tastes like slop. You keep doing that person, you be living them. And it, it's my biz. I didn't think anybody would believe me because he's the one that had all the money. He's the one that had all the power. They're in love. They feel like they can change the person. And the abuser makes the woman feel like it's her fault. And if you feel guilty and you feel vulnerable and you feel like it's something you've done, then there is this fear about leaving. By the year 2000, Darlena and Dr. Brown were still a couple with one baby and another on the way. Darlena figured that being pregnant, she'd get a break from her husband's scalding rage. She figured wrong. So what happened toward the end of your pregnancy, the incident that finally blew the lid off? I'm watching a show on TV at about 10 o'clock, and here he comes into the door. Mike comes in, and he immediately starts yelling that I don't love him. And I go into the kitchen, and I grab the phone, uh, like I always did, to call my mom. And uh, he grabs the phone from me and starts beating me over the head with the phone. She claims he grabbed her by the hair, dragged her into the bedroom. We had a four-poster bed, and I saw the bedpost on the floor, and I'm like, oh, no, this is going to be bad. And um, I was so used to it, though. Really? Yeah, I was used to it, which is just crazy. Um, but the next thing I know... Um, I'm on the ground, and he's sitting on my stomach, being seven months pregnant, telling me that I am effing not going to have that baby. He took the bedpost and was just beating me over the back um, with the bedpost. She managed to escape, but says he now started shooting one of those guns. Luckily, he missed. She was able to call 911. I can't even open my right eye from bleeding. I'm trying to go pregnant. Her face was all swollen. Her mouth was huge, and we'd beat on her on her head. They had uh, the, the long bedposts that are on their bed. Um, had this huge bedpost mark. I'm sorry. All the way down her back. Soon after, Dr. Brown was arrested. This is police video right after Dr. Brown was taken into custody. He's gone nuts. We're probably going to have to restrain him further. Smashing his head against the squad car window. The very last abuse that he did on me, it made it totally public. It was in the news, and I was in the hospital for three days. And um, at that time, I felt that, you know what, everybody knows about it. This is, my, this is my way out. Brown was charged with assault, and Darlena filed for divorce. As the separate proceedings worked their way through the courts, evidence turned up showing Dr. Brown's alleged behavior going from the belligerent to the bizarre. I think we put a gun to our head to get attention. Maybe a little bit, but we know it's futile. That's Dr. Brown recorded on his own video camera in 2001. 
Why is he holding a gun to his own head? He claimed he was simply working on a Hollywood script. People that do commit suicide, they don't do it to hurt people or because they want to do it or because they're cowards. They do it because they are being tortured during the agony. And that's, that's the only way to stop the pain. But Darlena doesn't buy it. She says it's evidence of a man on the edge. So that scene we see on this videotape was actually what you were seeing on a pretty regular basis inside this house. Yes. This, the prominent Houston doctor, was yes. what he was really doing behind closed doors? Yes. Pretty scary. Dr. Brown claims he acted in self-defense the night he was arrested, but the jury doesn't believe him. Darlena won a $3 million divorce settlement. He can't hurt me this time, because everybody knows. I think if you had to describe Mike in one word, it would probably be misunderstood. Brown's lawyer is Mike. Brian Weiss. It was his continuing bad choice in women, particularly a profile, if you will, of the same woman who would repeatedly show up in his life, somebody looking to get paid, somebody who viewed Mike as an ATM. Though he turned down our request for an interview, Dr. Brown did speak in this deposition. Darlena uh, lied uh, on the witness stand. Uh -huh. Her mother lied on the witness stand the day of the trial, and the jury believed Darlena and not the truth. Ultimately, he pleaded no contest to aggravated assault charges in exchange for 10 years probation and set off to resume his life. But the doctor's inner demons would not be silenced. There would soon be a new wife, new accusations, more sensational headlines, and another judgment day in court. He went to rage and he grabbed her. He was a dangerous man, and I wanted him to be held accountable for what he did this time. Look at my face. You see a man driven to insanity. Stay with us. Dr. Michael Brown's once charmed life has taken a hit. He pled no contest to assaulting his former wife, Darlena. Now, as Elizabeth Vargas picks up the story, this surgeon may be down, but he's hardly out. Dr. Michael Brown looks anything but the face of rage in this home video with his children following his divorce from Darlena. Say hi, Kevin. Maybe that's why all the sensational publicity surrounding his aggravated assault case didn't ruin his practice. The caring father, the passionate CEO, somebody who has done so much good for so many people. Dr. Brown's patients either don't know or don't care about his personal controversy. After his 2001 divorce, Brown's business thrives. Several new offices open. He's got a private plane, new homes, and things were going great. That is until he was called before the Texas Board of Medicine. It seems the private plane wasn't the only way the good doctor was getting high. He certainly seemed to have a problem with cocaine, and that's how he ultimately lost his license. Even though his license was revoked, Brown continued to live a charmed life. My baby got me a king throne chair. There was a beautiful new wife, Rachel, and a new family and more children. And a bunch of kiddos. Dr. Brown polished his image, distributing these photos from a self-published book, showcasing swanky parties, social events with luminaries like President Bush. Brown even won a humanitarian award, but once again, behind the scenes, the picture-perfect marriage was collapsing. It sounds like he, there's an aspect of his personality that is all about control and him just being able to, in spite of everything that he has to lose, express himself in whatever way he wants to. Wow. There's something about the way his personality functions that he continues to just blame and react and hurt people, and he finds that acceptable. You're out of your mind. They did not. It's cost fifty thousand dollars since you called the police, Rachel. Rachel recorded these phone calls from Michael in late 2011. You, I am not the enemy, Rachel. You attacked me, Michael. You attacked me. 
Rachel, who declined to do an interview with 2020, wanted proof that Dr. Brown was out of control. Will you ask yourself that, you stupid Those recordings became evidence after Rachel accused Brown of twisting her arm as if he meant to break it. Prosecutors charged him with felony assault. He's a repeat offender, and I think, and thought he was a dangerous man. And I wanted him to be held accountable for what he did this time. The trial of a prominent former hand surgeon is about to get underway. Former the case hits the Michael local Brown. news, and Rachel takes the stand to tell her story. Reach back. When he threw it at me, I moved my head. I'm really proud of Rachel Brown. She stood up to him. She testified, and she told the jury what he did to her. But her testimony isn't convincing. And Dr. Brown's lawyers call her a money-grubbing gold digger. It was all about money. I think that's what happened in his previous divorce case. It was all about money. Any troubles that he's had uh, can be traced to that. A jury has found a former surgeon not guilty of attacking his wife. In the end, the jury doesn't believe Rachel, and Dr. Brown is acquitted. I think everybody knows who Dr. Brown is. Very well-known hand surgeon. Uh, but you can't judge a case on who he is, what he is, what he has, what else. Uh, but I just feel like there was not enough concrete evidence to convict him. You can't worry about any prior cases. Triumphant in court, Brown's lawyers cut off his electronic monitor for the cameras. The judge has authorized me to cut it off. And the doctor was free once again to go about his business. I'm just relieved and, and want to take care of my kids and get on with my life. It seemed the doctor had vanquished all of his enemies, except perhaps himself. Fast forward to that flight from London, Dr. Brown allegedly wanted his dinner before the crew was ready. The crew claims that led to a shouting match, which ended with Brown grabbing and finally choking flight attendants, resulting in his arrest. Dr. Brown's attorney claims his client doesn't recall 